Okay. Good morning, all, and welcome to day two of what I consider to be an awesome collaborative event. And that is our food waste workshops, trying to find solutions. It involves partners from the Northeast Recovery Resource Recovery Association, the New Hampshire DES, Department of Environmental Services, and my own home state, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, and the Maine Compost School. So we are very pleased that you guys are here and we want to share this day with you. And please, as questions arise, are we going to do them uh, in the talks uh, or do we have to wait? As questions arise, shoot them off. That's, I'm that way too, I feel flow. Okay. Okay. Just a technical difficulty. Yeah. Cool. All right, so the USDA was very kind enough to fund this project. It came through the NRA. And so we want to give them props and also let you know that's a resource should you decide to try and do something in your community. I would access some USDA funds if you can. I would talk to the NRA. They can probably help you get a path. So the people that are here today to speak to you, and I think you'll hear from most of us. Tara is from the New Hampshire DES. Reagan is the executive director of the NRA, way in the back there. Most people hide in the back. Andrea, Andrea, Andrea is the person that handles communications for NRA, and she's done a lot of the logistical stuff here. Uh, that's me, uh, Mike North, over there. He's a supervisor for the uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and then Paige in the corner there. So we want you to enjoy yourselves and have a really good time while you're here and, and hopefully learn a few things. But what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is we are going to cover all these different things throughout the course of today to give you a chance to kind of pick up some things. But before we kind of launch into the actual talks, I'd like to give you a few logistical things. I hope you've identified where the bathrooms are. We've got a ton of food and we don't want waste. So please consume all you can and then when you leave, take it with you. So that way we have no waste. As you generate organics, if you want to put them in the food scrap bucket, Totally awesome. We love that. And that's going to go to a compost operation. The other thing is we have coffee cups that are listed as EPI certified compost. They really aren't compostable in a home bin or in a small compost pile. It has to be in a commercial operation that reaches 160 degrees for a six to eight week period. So we ask that you treat them as trash today and put them in the trash bucket. As time permits, we have a map over here of New Hampshire. I'm gonna put a dot for me over off the grid. But what we want you to do is look at these colors and match the best color to what you are, your activity is, if it's multiple, make, make three dots, but have them touch together, depending on how many that you have, and put it based upon your community and what you do. And at the end, this is gonna become a picture map which will go on the NRA website and will also go on the NHDS website. I might put it on my website too with that. But the idea is just that we want you guys to collaborate. So there's lots of opportunities for networking. So don't be shy, connect with us, connect with each other. And I think that's everything. So Mr. Nork is gonna come and talk to you about the regulations. Very good guy, so uh, listen up. All right, thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, for, for those of you who are just joining us today, welcome. For those who came back, thanks for coming back. Uh, my name is Mike North, and I'm with the New Hampshire DES. We're going to start off today with regulations because we've got to get that out of the way and then we get to the fun stuff. So I just want to give a brief overview of what New Hampshire's regulations are for composting facilities. For those of you that were here yesterday, there's going to be some review here, and then we're going to get into a little bit more about permitting options for municipalities as well in terms of like if you want to start a composting program or a food waste diversion program at your municipality 
what kind of steps uh, we might be able to take. So first, just as a general overview, the composting rules are in the solid waste rules. Uh, they are in chapter ENV SW 600. Um, throughout this slideshow, there are links to the actual rules that are cited. So when you get a copy of these slides electronically, you'll be able to click right through and read those regulations. So these rules pertain to facilities that compost solid waste. So in New Hampshire, solid waste composting includes food waste, it includes manures, uh, it includes uh, any kind of byproducts from food manufacturing, uh, but it does not include leaf and yard waste composting. So there's a weird quirk in New Hampshire's law that it's basically totally exempts leaf and yard waste composting from any, uh, any of the solid waste rules. Um, so the legislature decided that that was just something that wasn't going to be covered by the solid waste rules. So that, what that effectively means is if you're a facility that's just composting leaves and yard waste, there's no need for a permit. You don't need to come to DES for anything. You can just start that facility any day you want. Um, so I like to clarify that because that is it's a very common thing. Folks are composting leaves or yard waste, um, and those facilities are out there, but they're not permitted by us. So when you need a permit, it's primarily you know, when you're talking about composting food waste. In terms of uh, just a general overview, I'm going to go through siting requirements, operating requirements, and some other requirements related to maturity and testing. Um, in terms of siting requirements, those are in ENB SW603. And <clears throat> there are some basic setbacks for siting a composting facility to water bodies. There's a setback of 250 feet to public public waters, which are defined waters in the state, basically major lakes, uh, rivers, designated river corridors. Um, and so that there is a requirement that any solid waste facility needs to be set back at least 250 feet from those water bodies. There are water bodies that are not designated as public water bodies, such as small ponds or wetlands, uh, maybe small streams. Uh, in those cases, the rules require a minimum of 75 feet setback. These facilities also cannot be within the protect protective radius of a public water system well. So think like municipal water supply well, or um, it can also apply to wells that serve this office buildings where there's a, a, a kind of a steady population of people that are using the same water system week in, week out. Um, I think that's less common. Oftentimes, the office buildings or food service establishments are going to be on public water supply, but it does happen occasionally. Um, then there's requirements for the working surface, so the, the actual pad where the composting is going to be taking place. In terms of uh, the working surface, there needs to be a separation to groundwater to the water table and also to um, bedrock, sand, and gravel deposits. And that's a minimum two feet separation. So those are really, and then also the facility should not be in floodplain. That makes sense, right? Um, so those are really the, the major siting requirements. In terms of operating requirements, they're pretty straightforward, they're kind of common sense. Uh, most of the requirements focus on maintaining an aerobic process and uh, limiting odor, the generation of odors to the greatest extent practical and quickly incorporating waste as it comes into the site, putting it into uh, a bed of amendments or storing it properly so that it's not going to cause nuisance conditions. And uh, lastly, one of the major points in the, in the rules is maintaining that composting process at 131 degrees Fahrenheit for at least three days if it's an in-vessel or aerated static pile kind of method, or uh, 15 days if it's a windrow. And then in terms of quality and maturity, so this is another requirement for distribution of compost. Any, any compost that's going to be considered finished compost that's, that, that's going to be sold or distributed uh, needs to meet quality and maturity requirements that are set in the rules. The quality requirements are basically make sure it doesn't have heavy metals above certain thresholds, uh, that there's you know no presence of certain types of bacteria, um, and also that the compost is you know, has a minimum of uh, 
very de minimis amount basically of uh, inert debris, which could be things like glass, metal, plastic. And then there are requirements I mentioned for maturity. And maturity is basically a, a measure of how finished the composting process is. If it's immature compost, that means it still has potential to decompose and break down further. And in, in some cases, if you distribute compost that's immature, you could be causing detrimental effects on growth growing of crops. In some cases, immature compost is uh, actually beneficial to certain crops like corn, hay, because those are very tough tolerant. So our rules do actually allow for direct lane application of immature compost, but only in those kind of limited circumstances. Otherwise, the, the compost does need to meet the maturity requirements. Um, and the testing for both quality and maturity needs to happen at least once annually by the facility. So let's talk a little bit about permitting a facility. So this is also a big part of the rules. Um, in New Hampshire, there are basically three major categories, uh, permit categories. There's permit exempt facilities, there's permit by notification facilities, and then there's standard permit facilities. Um, this, this kind of structure actually applies to all solid facilities in the state. They're not just composting facilities. So even transfer stations and um, you know, other types of processing and treatment facilities, like scrap metal yards or whatever, they also have certain types of permit by notification or standard permit options as well, and permit exempt options. Um, but in terms of composting facilities, so uh, some examples of permit exempt composting facilities would be like site of generation facilities. That would be like a school that generates food waste in the cafeteria and then composts it on site. Um, it also applies to um, those of you that compost at home, you know, the food waste that you generate in the kitchen and then bring out to the backyard and compost there. That's also permit exempt. Um, it also, permit exemption also applies to farms. Um, if they're generating, say it's a livestock farm and they're generating uh, animal carcasses from mortalities that just happen to happen you know, through the routine livestock operations. Um, they can compost those on site. And uh, so those are some site of generation permit exemptions. There's also a permit exemption, it's the second one down there on the far left, um, that applies to community composting. So this is a situation where it's not site of generation. It's actually uh, allows for small scale community composting where folks can bring food waste to a local community center, like a, say a community garden or something like that. Um, and they can compost at a small kind of neighborhood scale. Um, those facilities are allowed to be uh, operated without a permit, as long as they're receiving five cubic yards of food waste per month or less. So those are some of the permit exemptions. Um, in terms of permit by notification facilities, there's only one permit by notification that's currently in the rules for a composting facility. And that's what we call a small food waste composting facility. I don't know why they call it that. That's just what it was called in the rules. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually not, it's not, in some cases, it doesn't need to be quote small because these facilities can receive up to 10 tons per day. Um, these permits by notification are available to public and private entities. So a lot of municipalities have already obtained a permit by notification for composting, and there are also private entities that have uh, done the same. And the thing about a permit by notification is it's essentially just an application process um, where you fill out a form, as long as the form is filled out complete, within about 60 days, you should be getting a permit, as long as you filled it out completely. Because by signing that permit application, you're basically certifying that you will do everything in, in accordance with the rules. And so the permit by notification has very kind of um, very defined boundaries around what is allowable under a permit by notification. So they have BMP, the, the rules specify the BMPs that the facility must adhere to. Um, and because the facility, because it's a very streamlined uh, permitting process, there's no public hearing. Um, you don't have to notify your butters. But because of that, that's why the boundaries are very tight on those facilities, because you want to make sure that those facilities are operated um, as efficiently as possible and not causing nuisance conditions for the neighbors. In terms of the standard permit, so that's the option all the way to the right. Um, 
that would really only apply for facilities that want to operate at a much larger scale. So they want to accept more than 10 tons per day, or they want to do something that's kind of outside the box or not, doesn't really fit into the mold of the permit by notification. So if they want to compost something that's, you know, a little bit different than what a permit by notification allows, um, that's when you might look at a standard permit. I think in most cases, a municipality is probably going to be looking at a permit by notification. Um, but for some private entities, they might be interested in a standard permit to allow them greater uh, facility capacity. Uh, and they uh, would have to go through a more intensive permitting process to do that. So the standard permit is the permit where you have a public hearing and you go through a technical review process with the department where they review plans and site siting criteria and things like that. Um, so again, it's intended for more of a larger scale or unique type of composting facility. So, so we've talked in general about the different permitting options. Um, now I want to dive a little bit into what might make sense from a municipal perspective. What kinds of options might you really be looking at? Um, so if you want to start a composting program or even just a food collection program where you transfer it to another site, um, there are two key questions that I think are going to help guide your decision making. One, how are, you, how are you going to collect the food scraps? And two, where are those food scraps going to be in? So with respect to how food waste is collected, the options are usually either drop off at a facility. So you have folks coming to a facility and dropping off uh, or curbside collect. I think for the sake of most of the folks here, I think are representing municipalities. In most cases, the place to start is going to be with a drop-off facility, especially in some of the rural communities. Um, because curbside, while it is an option, is going to entail greater logistics and capital costs potentially for collection bins. And there's going to be a cost of transportation, whether you sub that out to a contractor or you have your own trucks to do that. Um, so there's a lot more logistics that go into curbside collection. That may be something that municipalities are interested in, but in terms of Starting out, I think a drop off, uh, drop off option is usually the, the most feasible place to start. Um, and then as the program grows, maybe the municipality might look at curbside collection. Um, but so for the sake for the sake of today's presentation, really going to be focusing on drop off. Um, so if you're going to start a drop off program, there's also the question again, where are the food scraps going to be managed? So there's the option of managing them on site at the facility or collecting them and then transferring them to another facility where they can be either composted or sent to an anaerobic digester or something like that. So in the following slides, I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about um, these options for managing on site, whether it's collecting and managing on site or collecting and transferring off site. So with managing, managing on site, there's actually three pretty common scenarios for a municipal program. Um, the first option actually involves not getting a new permit at all. This is an option where a, a public transfer station that has a permit by notification. So there's, again, there's a permit by notification for transfer stations that is available only to mm -hmm. municipalities. It's called a limited public transfer station permit by notification, or we call it permit by notification, PBN for short because it's easier to go off the tongue. So I, you, I may slip up and say PBN in, 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 here in, a, in whatever. So <laughs> anyway, um, so this option, the first option involves not getting a new permit at all. Basically, you take your, your existing transfer station permit by notification, and you use that permit to also allow for composting at the same site. So it's a co-located composting facility. What you need to do in this scenario is notify DES. So you need to notify and write it. Hey, DES, here, I'm, I'm over, over here, town, you know, any town in New Hampshire. We already have a permit by notification transfer station. We're going to opt in to allow uh, our facility to start composting on site under that same permit. So you've got to write to DES, you got to update your operating plan, and then you also have to adhere to your existing facility um, capacity and service area. So whatever your transfer station permit says in terms of your capacity, 
for your service area, so the, the if you can serve surrounding towns or not. That option, so this is basically an option to use your transfer station permit as also a composting facility permit. So it's a little confusing, but it is an option out there. Um, the second option is getting a standalone PBN for some, the small food waste composting facility PBN. Um, this is an option for communities where they have a transfer station, but that transfer station doesn't have a permit by notification. So in some cases, uh, I think maybe the town of Bedford did this. I think they had a transfer station that had a standard permit transfer station. So they weren't eligible for the notification process, but they submitted a PBN application for a small food waste composting facility. And, but they ended up co-locating it at their transfer station anyway, because they had space to do that. In some cases, there are towns that have a separate site somewhere that's not on the transfer station property where they do the composting. So this is an option that can, it can be co-located at the transfer station, it can be somewhere else at a separate site. Um, the point is it's a separate standalone permit. So in that case, you would be actually submitting, because every permitted facility has to submit annual reports. So you'd have to be submitting two annual reports. So you need one for the transfer station, one for the composting facility. Um, and then the third option is, you know, potentially a, a small scale permit exempt community composting operation. I mentioned that these are uh, allowable as long as the facility is not accepting more than five cubic yards per month. So these kinds of community composting operations can be set up as like small satellite composting facilities. Um, might be a good option if the community has, uh, you know, it's a large land area and it's hard to get to the centralized transfer station or something like that. Um, so, yeah, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that those permit exempt facilities can expand and grow and then kind of graduate to a permit by notification if they so choose. Um, so anyway, so those are the three basic scenarios for managing on site. So if you're going to do the composting yourself. In terms of transferring offsite, there are two primary options. Um, the first option is, you know, using your transfer station, collecting at the transfer station, and using uh, some third-party site. You know, it could be sent to a, a local farm or to a commercial composter, maybe an anaerobic digester. Some of you have mentioned using an, uh, Vanguard Renewables or uh, Exeter AgriCycle. Uh, so there are options out there for collecting and then transferring offsite. Somebody else does the management for you. Um, this could be a good, you know, good option depending on your situation and your goals. If you don't have space for your own composting facility or you don't have the manpower to, to start off, um, so that's probably the most common is just using the transfer station as a collection point. And then, you know, because transfer that's what the transfer station does is it consolidates waste and sends it out somewhere else. Um, the second option could be a permit exempt food waste drop off facility. So, this is another type of permit exemption for collection of food waste. Um, it could be at a local um, food co op. I know the, the, the Concord Food Co op has a collection of food waste that's picked up by Renewal Compost here in New Hampshire. Um, the food co op over in Key uses Elm City Compost. So, they have a collection point there where um, residents and folks from the town come and drop off their food scraps and they, they go grocery shopping or something. Uh, so it's, it's a good kind of a good option for, you know, those community centers to function as a, a collection point as well. And it's, it's a permit exempt option as long as those facilities are storing no more than one cubic yard of food waste at any one time. So it is a, it is a kind of a, an easy way again to create a, a more distributed kind of network of collection points. And that, I believe, is everything. Um, I just wanted to note that you should have received a handout when you walked in this morning that is kind of a quick reference of the points that I just went over about managing on-site versus transferring off-site. So it kind of goes in into all the points that I just uh, talked about. And we have more at the table. So thanks for listening. Okay. Okay. Great. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paige Wilson. Uh, I'm a waste reduction and diversion planner at DES, so I work with Mike and Tara. Um, I'm going to set the timer on my phone. What button is that? I know time management, but it's not, not a big deal. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just going to uh, give an overview of some food waste diversion options, kind of highlighting some example scenarios that um, align with what Mike had just covered in his part of the presentation. Okay. Um, so yeah, Mike just covered permit options that are available. Um, just so to quickly recap. I'm using some of the same lingo. Um, there are several options to collect and manage on, uh, food waste on site as well as to collect and transfer off site, um, where the transferring process is then done by a registered hauler. So, um, curbside collection wasn't necessarily covered as much in the, in, um, the previous uh, part that might be just covered just because that's not really something we see a lot of municipalities doing, um, but I will have a slide with some options of private haulers um, that municipalities can share with their residents as options for um, curbside collection that they can then subscribe to. Um, so, let's see. I'm going to go through some examples of municipality food scrap diversion options um, and just have photos to kind of go along the way to then lead into that conversation about curbside pickup. Um, so the first option is to cover transfer station on-site composting with a PDN. Um, so this slide just kind of showcases the town of Hollis, um, which we have Joan Cover with us today and she'll be on a panel later to talk about um, more about the program, but to uh, kind of Start the uh, conversation is um, they they originally worked on a pilot scale, so starting with a small um, group of residents and keeping participation relatively small, um, using only or collecting only food scraps, um, no meat and dairy, um, similar to how the town of Brookline approached it. Um, where they had a PDN and simply had to notify DES that they were going to start separating their food scraps um, and has started that more recently doing a similar approach to Hollis where they just started with uh, fruit and vegetable scraps, no meat and dairy um, to see what their what they could handle, what it might what the process might look like on terms of like staff time and um, how they can incorporate it into their leaf and yard waste piles. Um, so they created a map that I pulled from offline to help residents understand where the compost pile is located. Um, and on the, um, in, in regards to where it's located, it's actually also near their brush pile. So they're keeping similar waste items kind of together in terms of where they're located at the facility. Um, and if I remember correctly, are you guys both in the South Eden Regional Landfill District? Is that correct? Awesome. So the second uh, option is small food waste composting um, with a separate permit to a transfer station permit. So two examples, um, the town of Peter, uh, sorry, the city of Lebanon, we'll start with them, uh, has uh, started with a pilot similar to how Brookline and Hollis did. Um, just starting with a handful of their residents, but because it was so successful and proved to be have a lot of economic benefits, they now serve as a regional drop-off site to the residents in their communities uh, that are also served by their landfill. So that service area includes 22 towns um, that span across New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, in Lebanon, residents dump out their uh, collection buckets into a pile, kind of in an open area. Um, so it's, you know, they're given a collection bucket and they basically bring it and drop it off um, versus the town of Peterborough where they have folks bring them and put them into um, these larger chokes. So just two kind of, kinds of examples of how towns are approaching the, the drop off process at their facilities. So moving on to permit exempt community composting. 
Um, so Mike had mentioned that community gardens tend to be a common um, site location for these types of operations. So I wanted to highlight the town of Tuckton Borough, which they primarily take food scraps from the residents that have plots in their garden. Uh, and so they have six bin areas where three of them are for feedstocks of like dried leaves or garden waste at the end of the season. Um, they also have some closed tote bins for like sawdust or shredded paper from their town office buildings. And then they have three, I think there actually might be a fourth one, not in this picture, but they have three uh, or more bins to help separate different stages of the composting process. So one might be for the more active um, compost, kind of like fresh fruit, scrap, uh, fruit and vegetable scraps and garden waste. And then they have more of an intermediate stage. And then finally they have like a curing bin um, where things kind of sit and then can be used at the next garden season. Uh, the other example I wanted to highlight is uh, Works on Farm, which started composting in 2022 um, with the support of the Composting Association of Vermont, uh, so CAV for short. Um, Natasha Duarte, she is the uh, director of CAV and got a USDA grant to help farms in New Hampshire and Vermont with starting small permit exempt uh, composting operations to also help with manure management. So it was um, kind of a dual purpose objective of managing food scraps, but also helping with manure management. So Works on Farm is one of the original partners from that grant, and then she received a kind of a second year to add more farms from New Hampshire and Vermont to that project, and New York, actually. Um, so I did put some asterisks to the side because they've actually grown to a point where they're planning to apply for a PDN. So kind of kind of showing like the success of starting small and being able to grow. They Works on Farm actually is probably one of the farms I hear the most comments about from that project. It's for some reason blown up um, and has had a lot of success. Um, also included in that project is High Water Farm from Bartlett, a Sweet Beet Farm in Bradford and Open Woods Farm in Grafton. So a good collaborative effort. Uh, so the fourth option is for transfer stations to be adding drop-off stations to collect food waste generated from households right at the transfer station. Uh, this tends to be a more popular option that we've seen from communities um, where a hauler comes in and picks up the food scraps, scraps to be processed elsewhere. Um, so that decision could be based off of um, space at the facility that, you know, might be kind of limited staffing time, uh, you know, concerns about dedicating time to processing and, and managing a compost pile, as well as maybe concerns around resident understanding or even staff understanding of how the composting process works. Um, so there could be kind of a, a myriad of decision making behind going with this option versus on-site composting. So the fifth example is uh, permit exempt community drop off sites. So these are a couple examples of satellite locations that are outside of the transfer station. Um, so they don't need a, uh, sorry. they don't need a permit as long as they stay within the parameters of um, of the EMB SW 600 rules. Um, so, for example, the Concord Co-op has a drop-off bin that's picked up by Renewal Compost. And then the Monadnock Food Co-op has a couple bins as well, and it's picked up by Elm City Compost based out of Keene. Um, so this just provides another option for folks to divert their food waste outside of just going to the transfer station. So as I mentioned, I was going to include a list of curbside haulers. So these are private businesses um, that we know of right now. I don't believe anyone's missing from the list, but if anyone in the room doesn't see their name up there, please let us know. <laughs> um, so uh, as I mentioned, we don't know of any municipalities explicitly offering food scrap composting, um, sorry, food scrap hauling uh, on the curbside level, but um, 
there are, we, we see that a number of the New Hampshire haulers, the top section of this list, mostly serve a lot of the southern part of the state. Um, so we recognize that there, the distribution of hauler service areas does not extend as much into the central and like northern parts of the state. Um, and then some of the out of state haulers are starting to trickle up to like the Plymouth area. I believe Plymouth State University is now working with AgriCycle to divert food waste from their kitchen. And then Vanguard Renewables is working with uh, Rocky Wool Deep Haven Camp in Holderness. Um, so they're starting to kind of expand, but the hope is to have you know more New Hampshire based haulers work with New Hampshire waste and keep it local, which is a message that Mark talked about yesterday. Um, so just some examples for folks to share with their residents if they're interested in diverting their food waste. Okay. Um, so uh, as Mike and I just you know, described permitting options as well as some examples, um, you might be kind of thinking about, okay, well, what's gonna work in my community or how can we improve? So we're just gonna backtrack for a quick second and think about some of the considerations um, and things to consider in determining the need for what kind of program you want to move forward with. So the biggest component is data collection. And um, this will be kind of repeated in a couple different workshops today, but it's really important to collect data to support your decisions and to be able to justify why you're making certain program changes. Um, so you can collect that data from within your town or just by looking at neighboring towns and you know, networking and workshops like this and kind of learning about what other people are doing and how they've been able to make it work for their community. And you might have similar ideas about, you know, that can translate into your um, town efforts. So uh, the purpose is to support your decisions and, and changes that you might be proposing um, and to gain town support, you know, at the residential level but also with municipal officials and the decision makers. So folks at Public Works, the Select Board, the Planning Board, you know, the Health Department, um, it's kind of good to have folks, you know, from all corners of the town decision-making process and within the town in order to make sure that the program changes you're making are gonna be successful and sustainable as well. So how can you collect all of this data? Um, there's this really a, a number of ways and you can get really creative with it, but one um, way is to conduct an audit and to weigh the waste that's being generated by households. Um, some towns have asked their, you know, a, a select group of residents that they know are interested in food waste to weigh their waste generated at home and then to bring that data back to them. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, there's also other ways to do research by talking to experts in the field, you know, the Mark Kings of the world and the Andreas and Reagan and Mike and Tara and I, um, but as well as talking to uh, other facilities and doing site visits and maybe coordinating with other communities that you know are interested in the same practices, um, as well as regional planning commissions and um, other kinds of nonprofits that might be able to help out. Um, and then if you, if you do go on site visits to bring your town officials and make sure that there's multiple people in your town that are kind of hearing the same information. Um, so it can be good to make sure that you have a group of folks that are maybe attending these visits or talking to the same people. So then kind of all here, you might catch something, you know, that somebody else didn't hear, but so that way you all have kind of the same information moving forward. Um, you might conduct a survey. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, 20 questions long. It can just be like one to five questions, really simple, yes or no, or like kind of what's your interest levels in certain practices? Do you, are residents even interested in composting? Do they know why food waste management and diversion is important? Um, really trying to gauge the interest from the community. Um, and I know that some towns have used really short surveys and just use them at town meeting because um, that tends to be a pretty uh, uh, 
big event that a lot of community members will attend, so it can be easy to capture more of your audience. Um, you might run a pilot project. A lot of communities have taken this approach just to kind of test the waters and see what type of capacity you have and how things can be managed properly. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to mention a full cost accounting assessment, which I'll dive into a little bit, but to um, really do a deep dive into the economics of, of your whole waste management program um, in the town. It doesn't necessarily just have to be for composting, but it can be an aspect of it. So one example for a town that is uh, did a survey is the town of New London. Um, basically, they did a survey, tried to gauge their resident interest in food waste, and then they ran a pilot for seven months with 20 households. And they diverted three tons of food scraps, so 6,000 pounds. Um, they used funds from their New London DPW revolving recycling fund um, and bought 64 gallon totes for the transfer station to collect the food scraps in. Um, and then they had renewal compost come to the transfer station and pick them up. And then they're hauled off to a farm in Derry, New Hampshire. Um, so I highlighted some of the costs behind that. But basically, they it was again really successful, and then they got uh, approval from the town through a town work warrant article to allocate twelve thousand dollars to add more households that can participate. Um, and they kind of decided to have participants interested in in you know in being involved go through an application process to make sure that folks that were going to participate understood the parameters of the program um, and that they were willing and committed to the process. So overall, they've, they've seen an increase um, for a savings of about $3,000 a year in their landfill tipping fees by implementing this food scrap program. Um, so circling to full cost accounting, um, you really want to run through your pro program with a fine tooth comb. Um, this can be a really great way to get some concrete data that looks at, holistically at the whole picture of um, how waste is being recycled, landfilled, incinerated, composted. Um, it can really help you understand the costs of running your facility in different scenarios and looks at the full picture while also helping you plan ahead for large investments into balers, um, front loaders, any kinds of big equipment that really should be thought of ahead of time. And even though sometimes something breaks and you're like, oh my gosh, we have to buy this big piece of equipment, it's gonna be really expensive. Um, so full cost accounting can also help you look at the um, depreciation value, is that the word I'm thinking of? basically the longevity of the equipment that you already have existing and when kind of, is it maybe going to be a time when you have to replace it? Um, so looking at cost effectiveness as well as cost prohibitive activities. Um, and as a snapshot of the checklist of data that you might need in order to do this type of work, um, like I said, it's pretty extensive, but it's a very great way to get a lot of the economics of your operations with staff at the facility and their employee salary and their benefits and as well as looking at folks in the town hall that might help with administrative oversight and how their time spent helping the facility um, operate might be cost effective cost prohibitive um, gathering information about the tonnage that's coming through a facility um, yeah, really, it's it's an extensive outlook, <laughs> and that is all that I have. <laughs> and awesome, sweet, caught up. <laughs> all right, we're gonna have some about the data collection examples that I ran through, as well as anything from Mike's portion too. If you want. Yes. Hi, Mike. Hi, that New London, July that portion of the week. Yeah, they say 3,000, but if you multiply 104 by 52, you come up with five, it costs them $5,408. So they actually uh, spent uh, $2,408. So 
So the savings is compared to their tipping fees. So if it's if you're saying that it was five what was it, five thousand something five uh, four oh eight. Right. So they're so they're saving three thousand, meaning that they're spent they would have spent more on their disposal fees well, versus what actually if they spent the three thousand then they wouldn't have to spend five thousand. Your math is that flawed. Yeah. 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 So it's costing them hundred and four dollars a week. Yes. Okay. So, so one of four times fifty two yep. is five thousand four hundred and eight dollars. Right. That when it saves three thousand and fifty, but it's costing five hundred what uh five thousand four hundred and eight dollars. Which is a which would this is that it would cost eight thousand at the tipping fee. So they save that three thousand on the tipping fee. So it's still a cost to manage food waste, but however, it's an cost avoidance. Like $625 for a coffee on top of the time that you're having with your MS So it's so that would come to what they would have paid. Let's trip through the big shot. Let's get it. But I think it was a shot. That's always good. I like that. Was how are there any types of fees and permits required for moving food waste basically across borders? Does the hauler have to be permitted not just in Vermont but also the hauler would also have to be registered, you know, at DES? Yes, so anyone who moves solid waste for profit purposes, it has to be registered in New Hampshire, and it's a very simple, it's free, it's very simple. The, it's like a one page form and you just have to do it once. But you do have to report annually. Correct. You have to report annually, yes, just like a facility does. But it is free. And you report on it? Yes. Tonnages. <laughs> yeah, tonnages and, how, and where you picked up from and where you might buy. We have Excel spreadsheets and documents and backup how to documents all on the DS website. So if anyone is interested in doing that, the tools and resources are there. Um, we usually will do a class once a year on that, but it really I need to start getting phone calls and say, hey, I'm ready to do it because it is a lot of work, there's a work session, and those that attend. Report that has to include all that. 
It's got all the math done for you, basically, or the formulas done for, for you in an Excel spreadsheet. It's just you plug in your numbers and it automatically calculates and makes all these charts and things that you can use. Yeah, pretty which pretty makes it easier. Yeah. It's a little overwhelming at first, but, I'm not gonna lie, it's, but it's very user. It, it, it's easy for the math side of it, which can be the most intimidating. Oh, <laughs> cool. yep. Mark's next. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm gonna try to stand here today. All right, so moving along, we're gonna talk now about how to basically develop and site a compost facility. And uh, it involves a bunch of steps that, that should be done in order. Most important thing is you need to start a compost program because it's something that your community wants to do. You know, there, there can always be one or two people that think it has to happen. You know, the community is not behind it whenever you start as a pilot and it ends as a pilot. So we like to try and develop community support as best we can. So the first thing is, is it right for your community? And so you ask yourself these questions. Do you want to reduce the amount of trash that you generate? Do you have or want to develop a school community garden? Sometimes people want to compost and then use the compost as a display. You want to save money? Who doesn't, right? I mean, that's always a good selling point. And do you want to develop an educational program that promotes sustainable environmental practices? Those are really important programs because if we can get education out of an activity along with money savings, that's like a super win. So that's what we shoot for. But in order to make things happen, I mentioned this yesterday and, and I drilled it in, you need more than one person. You need more than two people. There's got to be at least three or more folks interested in doing this activity. Because when you hit hard times, when you hit problems, if it's only just you, you may just give up. And if it's just a couple of you, you take turns taking the hits, but then you run out of gas. So usually it takes about three people to get something going and get it to be sustainable. This is super important because they have seen and done a bunch of different things. They've seen failures, they've seen successes, they've seen partial failures that they were able to breathe life into to bring them into successes. The number one thing I'm asking my state is you start a program, get a team together and invite me to your first meeting. I will size up your team and I'll give you the best advice I can. And then as you do a project, the first moment that you have a failure, or it starts to go south, call me then. Don't call me after everybody's complaining because it's a lot harder to fix a problem. But if you notice something's wrong, I can use and fix it right away. And that's a really key thing. So trust your regulators, bring them in sooner than later and make them a partner. As you start your whole program, bring them right in because they'll rise up with you. And as it's successful, they'll be proud of it. It was their state and they were part. So that's a really key thing. And so the division of San Diego, do you guys have a division of sustainability too, Tara? Sustainability, or is that my division of sustainability? Okay, all right, so anyways, right. So just make sure that you reach out and they'll guide you to where they need to be. And, and they may end up showing up and not say a darn word, but just having them there gives you an idea that they're dedicated to helping you as well. And that's really the key thing. So you hold your first team meeting, focus on good communication. You gotta remember that we have years for a reason and you gotta let everybody talk. It may be your idea and you may think it's the greatest thing in the world. Trust me, for me, that's hard to do as well. But you gotta just listen, listen, listen. Listen to every single problem that could occur and then take a breath and respond. And usually once people have had a chance to evacuate their brains, they're willing to listen to it. And so it's a really key thing. But you need to figure out who's going to be the, the different roles, who's going to be the hauler, who's going to be in charge of the operations, who's going to make sure there's enough amendment there, 
Everybody has a task to do who's going to be manning the food drop offs. And so as you look down through it, I have these key roles. The compost coordinator is the person that got it fired up. They may not be the one in charge. They may be the wind beneath the wings of everybody else, but you got to have that person. They're the motivated person. Then you have the compost monitor, and that's usually either a food staff person or a transfer station person that when you come in and dump your food, they take a peek. And if you have garbage in there, they're like, no, just the food. Because I was talking a little bit about education earlier with this unified fellow here. And the, and the answer is that you educate people at meetings, you educate people with handouts, you educate people with mailings. Maybe you do a public service announcement on a local cable TV. And then finally, you have a sign over the drop off area that says exactly what can and can't go in. You cannot educate it enough because people want to do the right thing, but they got to be told what the right thing is. So that's really, really important. And then, as you can see, I mean, all these, all these different people have a role, but the idea is that they work as a cohesive team and it's a well oiled machine. We talked a little bit about this before. Uh, in your community, the survey says how many people are interested in doing this. I always like to start out with about 20, 25 households. And they get basically, they come to the transfer station I'm working with. We have a little two hour seminar. We talk about the food drop off. We talk about how it's going to be used. We talk about the ins and outs. And then they get a bucket. And their bucket is a certain color with a sticker on it. And that's the only one that can dump food into the containers. And we start that out and what it does is it creates a buzz because the people that come in to drop off their trash see this person with this cool bucket and say hey what are you doing and you get bucks in my state transfer stations are as good as the general store people go on saturday to do their trash and catch up on the local gossip and all the other goodies so that's a great way word of mouth does a really good spread of a program so then what we do is we figure out who's going to be involved and if let's say that we're going to do a restaurant so we go to that restaurant and we choose what we want to do as far as how we want to assess it. And then we take a look at front end, which is where they receive things. I look at expiration dates, I'm kind of bad that way. And I find stuff that you know they're not going to get to for a couple of weeks, but it's going to expire in a week. So I immediately say, let's donate that to the food pantry. Let's get that out of here and let's get that into something good. So we figure out what's going to expire what they're buying too much of that they'll never use. And then we go to the kitchen where they're doing their prep work. And what we look at there is what kind of goodness gets tossed off as they make their salads and they start prepping their soup stock and other things. Can that go to feed animals? Can that go the upcycle to maybe be something really cool at someone's meal? So we try to find all the best uses up the stream. And then if not, that is the organics that I want to capture for composting because it is the cleanest stream coming out of the kitchen. It has the least <laughs> amount of problems except for the avocado and the banana stickers, right? So that peel and the asparagus has a rubber band around it, but the broccoli too. So we definitely want to try and remove that stuff. That's the cleanest material. Then we go to the center, right? The troublemaker, which is the people that scrape their plates. Over that area, is a big bold sign that says, please, no trash. It should be all just organics because people will scrape their, their plastic from their little crackers and stuff and that'll go in there. So just constantly reinforce that. And then we dive in the dumpster, what's left over? And it's in my state, it's about 24 to 30% of food ends up in the trash. So we figure out what can we do to capture it upstream? So that's the key thing. And then after you've done all that, you then discuss with your team, what are we going to capture? Are we going to capture just the stuff in surplus and the stuff in the kitchen to start with? I'm going to tell you that's the smartest thing you can do. Play with material that has the least amount of problems. If you can make that work, then let's enter post-consumer. But what pre-consumer does is it tells you whether or not you can actually handle this program. And it may sound like it's not capturing a ton, but really small footsteps, baby steps is what I call it. Start small, you're going to make small mistakes. And believe it or not, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And that's a really cool thing to remember. It keeps you on tack. So the residual characterization study, as I said, you start at the 
the storage area, then you go to the, the kitchen prep. This is the scraping. This is the grossest one, right? Because this has got all that potential stuff, but it's also what can be recovered. And then the dumpster dive. This is just the school system, but this is basically what they've set up. They basically have a recyclable piece. So they have the little, we have a bottle that we made. So we capture all the bottles we can. That, that should value. Then the food goes in the middle and then the trash that's left over goes in the last can. Train them young, they become adults that are responsible. And believe it or not, young trainees become smart asses that make adults responsible, which is a good thing. So as far as collection goes, we've talked that to death, so I'm not going to really dive into here. Other than say, make it a well-defined area. In, in my state, where we have them outside of the transfer station, they're next to the public, where people gather. They're next to the public library under a streetlight because you're going to have the midnight vandals that either are going to mess it up, or dump trash in it. So you have a whole bunch of baby diapers and launch them in there. So make it so that they're embarrassed because they're under a spotlight if they do it. People don't want to be embarrassed. And they do want to do the right thing, you just got to remind them. So just make sure that you have a good collection area and the container. I will tell you that if it's a service coming to get you, 64, 96 gallon, no problem. If it's a transfer station operator, anything above a 34 gallon container is heavy. And, and you can actually risk them hurting their back trying to lift it or even trying to move it. So it's really important to make sure that you don't overtax your employees and cause any physical injuries. When we do it at colleges and high schools, same thing, 34 gallons is the size I choose because that couple of kids can yard on that pretty good. A 64 gallon toter, it's filled three quarters, about 400 pounds. That's, that's the problem to have. And then about 30 to 45 minutes per day, it, it's not a lot of time, but it's intense time. And if you don't have focus, it's a chance to get a lot of problems. Contamination sneaks in if you're not focused. So just always remember that. This is how we started the University of Maine at Farmington. We have 1,200 kids that go to the college, well, adults, sorry. And basically, we started up with a five gallon pail with a screw top lid. Reason why June, July, and August, when it's hot, jars, they swell, they get stinky. This has a gasket seal. So it doesn't smell until you unscrew the lid and then it. You know, so you've got to have a little protection on that. But we graduated from five gallon pails to 34 gallon totes. Worked really good. Collection, weighing. Why? The only reason that we waste that, well, we do, we waste up for two reasons that I, that I, if I'm in a school, I want kids to actually get that data and make graphs of how much weight they've saved for the school board, show them something. The other reason that we weigh it is just to prove that we're removing a portion of the waste stream and, and making, if we have to kind of defend this for the budget people, it lets them know that we're doing a good job. So those are two major reasons. But you basically take the material for the compost site, we take temperatures, we mix in the ingredients, we add the bulky material to do the cleanup. So honestly, incorporating food into a compost process, you bring it, you drop it, you cover it. So you have a base of amendment and a cover amendment. And what that does is it's your first chance to control odors. So if you're at a transfer station and the biggest concern is that it's going to smell or it's going to attract animals, you put a bed of horse manure or sawdust shavings down or whatever carbon source that you have and you dump the food on it and you cover it, you've taken the odor away because it's going to be absorbed into all that amendment. And the minute you take the odor away, you take away the nuisance animals and you take away the complaints. So your first chance to control odors is on receiving it. And sometimes you let it sit for a week or two, depending on how gooey it is. And then it gets mixed into a pile. By then, all the amendment has absorbed the liquid and the stink is gone. Yes, sir. Mark, can you tell me again what temperature is too high that the compost will start burning or possibly ignite? Okay, this came up yesterday. There's only one time that it'll occur, and it's when the pile is super duper dry and has an excessive temperature in excess of 161 degrees. And it happens very rarely. The only places that it happens routinely is Texas and Arizona. And because they have dry winds that constantly blow through the pile, they dry the heck out of it and they make their piles about 20 feet tall. So it's all the recipe for disaster. 
We like our piles to be about eight to 10 feet tall, usually a two to one slope, so 16 wide. And we don't have those problems. Maine's a wetter state, so we don't see that. The only time we see it in Maine is during mulch piles. Once again, if they're too tall. So, so the ideal temperature is about 150 degrees? It's 131 to 155, 60. Yes. All right, so the weekly task, once again, all these things are maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. It's turn on, on a regular basis. Designing your system. I'm a big fan if it's going to be a small home compost kind of area or a school or a hospital like a little hospital. I like a three bin system. Each one of those holds one cubic yard of material, and that's the minimum needed to stay warm all winter. And basically, the way that it works is you fill that first one with layers of ingredients, carbon food, carbon food, carbon food. When you hit the top, you flip the first to the second and start filling the first again. When that first one is full again, you flip the second to the third and so on and so forth. What you end up with is three good mixes before it goes into the final phase of compost. So it works really good. This is the bin that I advocate. Earth machine, garbage. Little tumbler, garbage. If you are into aesthetics, buy one, that's cool. But if you are into something that works, will always work and will last forever, lobster trap bin. You can get that from any company that makes lobster traps. You get a section that's 12 feet long by three to four feet in width, and it makes a cylinder and that sucker will compost exactly one cubic yard and it stays hot all winter long. And it is the simplest thing in the world. And basically it's renewable. You can use it. I have ones that are 25 years old, not showing anywhere whatsoever. This is not, a lady asked me about chicken wire yesterday and I didn't have the slide yesterday, but this is what happens when you use chicken wire. You gotta replace it every year because they're not durable. A lobster trap wire, you can do handstands on it. You can hit it with your tractor, no problem whatsoever. Yes, sir. You mentioned the place yesterday where you get this stuff. Yeah, it's Brooks. Yeah, the company's called Brooks Trap Mill, B R O K S Trap Mill, in, and that's in Thomas and Maine, but I believe they have offices in Massachusetts, and then there's one in New Hampshire as well along the coast, and it's just lobster trap wire. Okay, so this just shows it again at a school. This is this is done the whole school year by doing layers method by method. These are the kids. I got to take these pictures. I can sign releases. These are kids that are in a special behavioral program because they're hard to deal with in the classroom. I might have been put there when I was a kid, but they didn't have these programs back then, so I just got smacked around. But still works. Teachers teachers discipline me well. But these guys got in and got physical work done. And what that does is it takes all those behaviors and all those thoughts that get you in all different directions and you channel it into aggressive compost turning. And they made some really decent compost. And they were proud of the moment, they were proud of what they did. So it was a really cool thing. Once again, three bin system, uh, no, no magic there really. Pallets, please, if you're gonna use pallets, put in hardware cloth with a little sweetie inside. Because if organics get in the nooks and crannies, it'll stink, and that brings in rats. So I'm, I'm all for recycling pallets, but only if you do it in a way that's not going to make the gooey, gross compost. So I replace these with lobster trap bins, by the way. These are great if you have hyperkinetic children, children that basically are really <laughs> busy, and, and you send them out in the yard, you have them flip and spin, and this thing is a ball you kick around. And that's how you, you make the compost work. It's like a big beach ball. So if you have hyperkinetic kids, perfect. Just some other examples. That's that's a little bit better than chicken wire. That's the sheet fencing, but that's actually more expensive in some cases than lots of trap wire. So but still works pretty decent. Open system, by far the easiest. If you got a little garden tractor, make a heap, keep turning it. It's a beautiful thing. So I'm, I'm a fan of that. That's what I do at home. This is actually the Massabesi Middle School in Waterboro, Maine. And they actually use horse manure and food from their cafeteria. And this stuff is gorgeous. They make beautiful compost and they sell it at the local flea market, the local farmer's market. But what's really cool about it is that they put this material in a cubic foot bag and they sell it for $5 a cubic foot, right? Well, you add that up, there's 27 cubic feet in the yard. 
So for one cubic yard of compost, they make 27 times $5. That just tells you a great way for kids to make money. Am I running out of time? Oh, yeah. Oh, real bad? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How many more do I have? Really? So you almost got okay. it. So this is far, farm tractor. Uh, so this is what I do at home. I think it's the best way to compost. All right, so step number seven, this is a student-based thing. This is curriculum. Develop an educational program. If you want to see some curriculum, www.composting.org, my website for the compost school. Give you some good information. This is just some things that kids can do. They can make graphs of temperatures. They can make graphs of weight. They can draw pictures. I love bringing kids into it. Step number eight, do it. Pick your system, make it work. Okay, and if you can't figure it out, give Mike a call. If Mike can't figure it out, he'll give me a call. We That's the cool thing about states that work together, is we work together. So straight up, very cool stuff. Once again, the various systems, I have a little spinner up in the upper uh, right, but only because it holds a cubic yard. I don't want to compost less than a cubic yard. Then this is just some open compost systems here, different tractors. And then use your feedback. So basically, not just the data, but how about the people? What's your sense of satisfaction? You love this drop off? You love this idea? Do you get free compost? Do you bring it home or do you hate your life? And then we'll figure it out. And then that's some of the data, all really good stuff. And then finally, this is the most important part use it. Or its value. If you put extra time in to create a really stable, awesome compost product, make sure that people understand that it's not the good old leaf and yard that has twigs and branches and bottles and GI Joe with a kung fu grip and whatever else ends up in the community trash. This is high quality stuff. It provides organic matter to the soil, it provides some trace nutrients, it holds on to water during drought. Super important they understand that. And it holds on to nutrients, NPK, not a lot, but over time. You might get two years worth of nitrogen out of this, but slowly. So it augments your fertilizers. And then if your soils are compacted, it loosens them up so roots can penetrate. Compost is like, it's, I used to be a paramedic, and when I brought somebody back to life with the paddles, that's what compost does. It defibrillates your soil. And that's the best way to think about it. And... Oh God, there's still more. Yeah. Uh, two. All right. So the public's perception of the compost is fertilizer. Tell them no. It's a soil enhancer. Period. Soil enhancer, not a fertilizer. And make sure that you don't sell it for more than it is, but don't undersell it. If you think your compost is awesome, test it because test may say it's not awesome. If you think it's awesome and somebody uses it and destroys their plants, you're not going to be awesome. So test it and then be proud of it. That's the most important thing. And then finally, as far as selling compost, I have kids show up. Kids sell compost better than any other gimmick you have in the world. Have them sit there and have them say, you want to get a bag of compost or do you want to get a cubic yard or two? Go inside here, this stuff's awesome, it's black gold. Kids will sell anything, so. <laughs> Okay. Okay. This is that compost. No, yes, www.composting.org. Yeah. All right, yes, www.composting.org. Dot org. Yes, dot org. Yeah, you thought I said dot com. Massachusetts for over 40 years, helping them to manage their own recycling and waste reduction programs. And I'm very glad to have you all here today. So, this morning you've already heard about composting regulations, permitting options, we've talked about implementing food waste diversion activities. Um, how to determine what needs you have in your community, and then siting considerations if you're going to be moving forward with a composting project in your community. So what I'd like to talk about now is 
the collection process. So I like this topic because it really gets to uh, sort of the nitty gritty of how you're going to be interacting with your residents, how we can talk with residents about collecting food scraps in their home, and then also how you're going to think about collecting those materials in your community or your um, institution where you work. So first, can I just get a show of hands? Who here works with a works at a community or a business that is already collecting food scraps for diversion? Okay, great. So what's nice is that you one have folks in this class who have that experience. And for the last hour of this session today, we're actually going to have a great panel conversation where you're going to get to hear sort of the uh, soup to nuts about how folks have practically um, implemented these programs in their communities. So let's get started. I'm going to be chatting with you guys about how to collect food scraps at home um, and also in your municipal location. We'll talk a little bit about cost considerations, both for residents and municipalities. And the last, we're going to touch on a few case studies. So collecting at home, there are a variety of options that residents can use to collect material at home. Some of the most common include some kind of a container with a tight fitting lid that you can keep on your countertop. So for example, this metal option is one that I actually used in my own home for many years until it sort of rusted on me and started to leak at the bottom and I got fruit flies on occasion. And then I sort of gave up on that. And I personally use a Tupperware container that I keep in my fridge. And so that is one tip is that you can store containers in your fridge in order to eliminate the issue with fruit flies in the warmer months and to reduce odors as well. Um, but whatever system works for folks, whether it's a countertop or keeping something in your fridge, uh, then you're going to need something you're going to regularly be emptying that into. And so it is common for uh, services, for services that haul away material from private homes, to provide a five gallon bucket with a tight fitting lid. It's something you can keep outside your back door um, and just be emptying material into on a regular basis. So at the Northeast Resource Recovery Association, one program that we offer for our member communities, which includes about 90% of the communities in New Hampshire, is a biannual compost bin sale. And so actually the plastic lid, uh, the plastic container with the lid on the upper right is an example of a sort of residential collection bucket that we sell as part of that program to our municipal members who can then turn around and give them away uh, for free to their residents or sell them at, um, for cost. And we do have a number of uh, recycling waste reduction committees and communities that will participate in this program so that they can support uh, collection at, uh, for the residents at home. So many communities that already have an existing food waste diversion program in place, they require that residents use some kind of compostable bag to bring the food scraps to their facility. So here are two common uh, options. Bio bags, we have some giveaways today from that company that they sent us. Bio bags are certified compostable bags. Uh, you can also use paper bags. And these are just a good way to reduce the mess and to reduce odors when you are um, delivering your food scraps to a collection site. So, for example, in uh, Bedford, Bedford, Durham, and Levin, they actually require that one of these options be used for bringing food scraps to the facility. Um, Exeter, for example, makes use of these items optional, but this is a common way to reduce that mess. So then once residents are bringing food scraps to the facility, the question is, how are you going to collect it at the facility? So you can have people put material directly onto the compost pile, uh, which is how Durham handles their um, food scrap collection. You could have 64 gallon totes, which are quite common, 
So the upper left is an example of a 64 gallon tote that the town of Littleton uses. They then have that material taken to a local farm for composting. And then you could also have a larger collection container that might be provided from a service that you're using to haul away your food scraps. And here's an example that Bedford has. Um, and this was provided by Renewal Compost and is then uh, emptied in that way. And so these are all options for residents to be bringing those scraps to your facility. So one tip is that if you are running into the issue where residents are bringing their material in a non-biodegradable plastic bag, you might want to consider putting a trash uh, collection container adjacent to your food scrap collection so that people can conveniently throw away those plastic bags that you actually don't want mixed up with food scraps. So you also will need to think about how to store the material at your facility. So you'll want to lock and otherwise secure those bins at night and when there is no, when there are no staff present at the transfer station in order to prevent people from putting in material that they shouldn't be, but also to make sure <laughs> that your material is going to be prepared for, for those of you who are, which is just about all of us, this is New Hampshire, um, those of us who have bear activity in our area. And so this is actually a really great example um, of a custom storage container that New London uh, created for securing their bins when they're not in use. You also might want to think about adding a sawdust, a little sawdust layer to food scraps at the end of each day to help reduce odors and larvae. Um, and of course, signage is an important piece as well. And we'll be talking more about signage when we discuss um, public education later today. Now, as you've heard, there are no communities in New Hampshire that are currently offering at the municipal level curbside collection of food scraps, um, but we certainly do have some private businesses that offer sort of residential curbside pickup. Um, you know, one of the benefits about thinking about doing a curbside, um, municipal curbside pickup is that it does make it much easier for people to participate, so it tends to increase participation rates. Communities can either rely on a contractor to provide the containers and transportation, or the town could get their own equipment to do that. Uh, and many communities, they typically, when they offer curbside collection, they typically do that on a weekly basis because you are dealing with stinky smelling material. And we don't want residents to have to hold on to that for too long in their homes. So I am gonna talk a little bit more in some case studies at the end about some communities not in Vermont, or not New Hampshire, but nearby, that have used, um, have implemented curbside organic support. So let's think about the cost for residents if you're going to implement a municipal program. So most, if not all, New Hampshire towns that currently offer uh, compost collection, they offer it free of charge to their residents. So the city of Lebanon is an example of a community that initially charged an annual fee when they were doing a pilot program for their organics collection, but ultimately they decided to offer that as a free service to their residents once they got started. Um, some, some communities, you know, if you're requiring your residents uh, use compostable bags and you're not providing that as a service to them, then that's the cost that the residents may need to have. Um, and certainly if a resident is using a private collection service, then they would need to pay for that. But, yeah. If you're offering at a municipal level, that is typically free of charge. Now, the bigger question I think is really what are the costs for municipalities? So there's obviously going to be some staff time involved with um, keeping an eye on what residents are contributing to your organics collection. Certainly, if you're composting on site, there's going to be some additional staff time required. But as you'll hear, um, you know, some communities have had the ability to keep that staff time fairly minimal. There is certainly going to be a fee if your community is paying to have those food scraps pulled away. Um, and of course, if you're composting on site, some additional costs would include 
fuel and use of equipment to turn those compost piles. Now, I am going to share some examples related to cloth, um, but I'm not going to be able to go into sort of a deep dive on what it might cost to a community to start a program because it is so specific to individual communities. <laughs> but certainly, I think when we get to our panel conversation, you'll be able to also ask some specific questions about how those costs are working out for those individual communities. So just one quick case study. You'll be hearing later more about Hollis, New Hampshire, um, but they do compost on site. Um, they report that it uses relatively minimal staff time in order to operate their program, in part because staff are already there with the equipment during normal hours. They have just two trash cans that are used for collecting their food scraps. And just to clarify, they're an example of a community that does not accept meat or dairy as part of their on-site composting program. Then we have the town of Lee. Uh, they report that by using Mr. Fox compost, they have very minimal staff time involved with monitoring this program and overseeing it. They also have two 64 gallon totes that they use for residents to uh, bring their material to. And they're paying about $144 monthly for, the, for four weekly pickups. And in this case, the town of Lee actually pays for the bags that their residents are required to use to bring in material, um, which is sort of a nice benefit that they provide to their residents. And then we'll also be hearing more about the town of Helen. They also use a pickup service. They've got um, two 64 gallon tips that are picked up on a weekly basis. And in this case, their material is going to Vanguard Renewables, which is actually taking that um, those food scraps to an anaerobic digester. And they report that they spend about $219 monthly for that service. And here's just a photo of their um, site. And you can't see it clearly, but they have really good signage there to direct the residents. <laughs> and then the last case study I have is an example of a community, not in New Hampshire, but Hamilton, Massachusetts that does offer curbside collection of their um, food scraps. So they have about 12,000 people in this community. No, excuse me, they have about 7,700 people in this community. And they provided every resident one kitchen counter collection container and then also a curbside collection bin, in this case, a 13 gallon bin. You can see it on the far right in the photo. They don't require the use of paper bags or compostable bags, but they allow that as an option for their residents. And you can see they've got a weekly pickup, and they actually are able to take this material to a local farm where it's composted in their community. Another example is Brattle Royal, Vermont. They've had a long standing um, curbside composting program. They have about 12,000 people in that community. And they are able to have that material picked up weekly and again brought to a local facility that is composting that material on site. And that actually brings us to a good segue, which is that we're next going to be talking about what to do with the compost that you generate. Um, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer a few before we turn this over to Tara. Are the compost bags? Are they the same as the hospital that they use in the hospital? It's a great question. Do you want to repeat the question? Oh, the question is those those bio bags, the compostable bags, are they limited only to commercial composting sites, or can they go in sort of a, a, a composting? Yeah, that was my guess. And that's a common misconception that residents have where they see anything labeled as compostable. And one, they might think it's going to compost in a landfill, which is absolutely not true. 
And then two, they might think they can use it in some you know, small backyard compost pile and they'll eventually learn that it's not gonna go anywhere. So those, those types of products are limited typically to those commercial facilities. They can go and keep a pile hot for weeks at a time. Yes. Um, I've taken a couple courses on composting in Vermont and also visited a couple of, them, of the commercial ones. And they don't even want it because unless it's certified compostable, um, maybe more than more can clarify that. I mean, there's a lot of things that are said, and you know this better about recycling. They label something recyclable, and it isn't. It's the same with the composting bags. Not all of them, even the certified ones, have the struggle commercially. And it's so much easier for them not to, because they have to, uh, uh, what's the term where you have to uh, filter out at the end? Screen. Screen it. Screen it. Yep. Mm -hmm. all, almost all of them screen it uh, because of all these plastics that are in there. Um, right, so that's a very good point. Is that some facilities simply say we won't take any compostable, certified compostable, um, you know, cups, food packaging because of that concern. I will say that the city of Lebanon, they also take material from Dartmouth Hospital and they work with Dartmouth Hospital to make sure that all of their, I see the sort of cafeteria foodware is BPI certified compostable. So they're, they can feel confident that there's no PFAS in that. And so they do accept that material and they do compost at such a level that they're able to uh, safely compost that. Are they composting on site? Mm -hmm. Correct. They're composting on site. They're composting on site where they already have a, an adjacent landfill and then they're able to use that and material. Get those chemicals that you need. Correct. Yeah, they, they, I would not describe them as a, uh, a good example is sort of a small rural community with a composting operation. They're, they're much larger operation that way. Yes. Our pictures, you said it's not outside. Do those all have composting? No, I believe all the photos I had in there, I tried to only get local um, examples of drop off locations. Yes. Transfer stations. Actually, Correct. Transfer stations, yes. Um, for the municipal expenses, this is our first year. That we'll be doing testing at the end of the year. So, what, what are people finding for the cost of testing that finished product in the state of the um, I did not speak to that. Anyone on our panel, have you guys done any testing that you'll be able to speak to later? No. Yeah, you're a slide on the cost of the box. It was $144, then it was $219. Pays those costs, and what does that mean? Right. So I'm sure our panel can speak in more depth to those, but in general, I mean, those costs are going to be paid. And in those cases, those costs are paid by the municipality. Um, they're not charging their residents for those fees. Um, and I'd say in many cases, they'll be able to share that they're typically saving money because it would be more expensive for them to throw away that food waste than for them to have it all the way through this service. But the biggest, one of the biggest pieces of that cost and what impacts it is the haul fee. So it depends on where that material is being taken to, you know, how far the company has to come sort of out of their way to pick up that material. So um, hauling is gonna be a piece of that. All right. Thank you all. We'll turn it over to Jeff. Good morning. So um, I haven't had a chance to introduce myself. I am Tara Albert. I run the solid waste operator training program for the state of New Hampshire. Um, and I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk very shortly on What's the plan for the compost you're producing? This is that kind of last step you really need to think about before you actually start composting. And you've decided that you're gonna compost on site, but what are you gonna do with it? What is the purpose of composting besides just pulling it out of the waste stream? Are you gonna use it on site for beautification projects? Um, are you gonna bag it and sell it for profit? 
Are you going to allow your facility users to take it back to their homes and use it on their properties? Uh, are you going to use it just in municipal projects? Are you going to use it for erosion control on site, even on landfills? And it would promote vegetation on slopes and help prevent erosion. Um, there are so many other possible applications that you can use. However, there's an asterisk here, and they may require additional permits. So you need to start thinking about those things and what you're going to do with your compost. Once you determine what you're going to do with it, you're going to need to look at your feedstocks. You're going to need to develop a recipe that makes the most sense for the usage of your compost. Yesterday, for those of you who were here, we did a feedstock exercise. We had, you had all 18 buckets out in the front lawn. We were going through to figure out what the heck is going to be going into our compost. The type of compost that you are creating, especially compost that you want to sell, um, you need to make sure that that recipe is refined and defined. Uh, this is just a few examples here of feedstocks. So food waste, hello, that's why we're here today. Um, and then you've got leaf and yard waste. Just about every transfer station in the state of New Hampshire has a leaf and yard waste compost pile on site. So you can mix that in. Manure and animal bedding. Uh, you will hear from Mr. Mark King, horse bedding or hoss bedding. Hoss bedding is gold. <laughs> Then you've got wood chips and then paper and packaging scraps. Are you going to be using those? And then you've got this other special waste. We uh, are going to mention it and then move on. So there are other special waste that may require an additional permit. And for example, this is an example, you may be looking at incorporating biosolids for whatever reason. If that is the case, if there's an entire set set of regulatory requirements that you need to follow and possibly even a second permit that you're going to need to get from DES residual to management section. That's just one example of outside the box items that you may be wanting to compost. There is a bit more to it than just, okay, we're going to make some compost and figure out what we're going to do. Also, while I was putting this together, the, the, the group of us, we talked about this and they said, Tara, you have to remind them also that composting can be used at any stage. So we have our baby compost. This is Andrea, our baby compost here. This is when you're in that first stage. Um, you can do, it's fresh. You can do direct land application for that. Um, if it's in your junior compost, it's, it's ready, but it's still kind of curing. Um, you, if you don't use it properly, you're gonna kill whatever you put it on. But it is very good for crop use for, for hay or corn because they can sustain the salts and the things that are in the junior compost. But after that compost matures and is retired, that's when it goes into those gardens. So I think of my, my grandmother out there with her potted plants. I'm like, that's what she has is the mature compost. So once it's done, you can use it in your garden. So some resources that you can look to, to figure out what you're going to do with your compost and what the best step is for managing your compost. They're linked here. These presentations, as we have said, are gonna be posted online. Anytime you see the text that's either blue or is underlined like that, they're clickable links within the PowerPoints. So you don't have to you know, type the whole link or remember everything. You can click on those links and you'll be good to go. If you have questions, um, especially if you've got some of those other compostable items, give us a call. We can help you determine what your best step is, what your next step is, or do you have permitting obligations that you do need to do? And you can contact my and page and then also our permitting section there. So that is the very end of that presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I'm just quick. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The snake worm problem that we've been developing around here, the end cases tend to be the leaves. Okay. For yard waste. Okay. So we're very carefully convincing in the compost. Oh, that'll kill it. Is that the is that the jumping worm, the Asian jumping worm? Oh yes. Um. It is a nemesis. It is something that we do need to work on. Yes, the very high, high temperatures. Um, I a couple of recommendations. One, before you allow your, your um, 
it to leave your property, the leave the transfer station, check it. To go through it, look at it, make sure, do some inspections on it, and test it, and see if they are in there. Um, but the other option is to contact um, the cooperative extension. And yeah, it's kind of one of those things where the. It doesn't have to be it's any of these at all. Yes. I bagged some that I left in there for a couple of years, hoping that the black bag would get high enough to it kill it. But I, I'm not sure. Yes. So in May there will be a jumping worm discussion. Yes, that is definitely something maybe we should put on our site too. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. And this is going to be even faster than the last presentation. So for those of you who are at the permitted New Hampshire solid waste facility, you know that there's such a thing as facility operating plans. And every single facility needs to have no. uh, They are a requirement for all permitted solid waste facilities in New Hampshire. And that plan needs to be up to date. It needs to be developed before the application is submitted to DES. And it is for all applications regardless of what type of permit in which you hold. Now, the items that are required in that plan are outlined in EMP SW 1105. While I'm mentioning operating plans, I'm also going to talk about closure plans. They are also required, and they are outlined in EMP SW 1106. And there are very specific things that needs to be in those plans. Now, how do you know when you need to either create a new operating plan or update an existing plan. A new operating plan needs to be written when there is a new facility or when a new application is filed for a facility. Now, existing plans need to be updated when the facility has an existing permit by notification and is required to notify DES of the composting activities at the facility. Remember, we talked yet, for those of you who were here yesterday, remember we talked about the three types of permits that you need to have for composting, and that one is if you already have a permit and that notification, the operating plan comes with it. And then when a permit modification is submitted for a standard permit, the existing operating plan must be, sub must be updated and then resubmitted for approval to DES. And that operating plan needs to be approved before you implement the activity on the site. So I will take of this moment to say that anytime a change happens at the facility, that change needs to be reflected in the operating plan. Whether it's composting activities or other types of activities, it needs to be updated. Did I give you enough information there to say, hey, what do I do next? Or are you realizing that your operating plan might be out of date? Here's some help. Um, we do have the intro to operating plans workshop through SWAT. Uh, we have in-person plans, but we also have the pre-recorded option. It is up there, it's available. Uh, the pre-recorded option, it literally goes through all of the sections and talks about what is required in each section. It's a pretty short um, video. It's only about 40 minutes and you can pause it and pull out your plans and go through um, and take sticky notes and mark in your operating plan. The in-person workshop, it's a two and a half hour workshop and we work with you on each section and we kind of troubleshoot and talk about the different types of plans uh, or parts and things that are needed in your plan. So you bring it with you. The other um, workshop that we have added this year or last year is the writing operating plans. It is a work session. The DES staff sits with you for two and a half hours. We keep it small, but we only allow five to six um, facilities in attendance and we go through your plans. We talk to you about what's missing. We talk to you about what language makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Um, and I will put a caveat on these that um, we do not generally allow landfill operators to come in with their operating plans. Those are much larger plans and you need way more time and more engineers to sit for you to work on those. Uh, so it's a more involved process for those types of facilities. We also have resources. We've got checklists. So the operating and closure plan checklist there. Online, there's a template to tell you what needs to go into those plans. Um, 
use your facility permit. I'm going to highlight this. The number of people that have to talk about their facility and don't even know what their facility name is, the permitted name. So use your permit. Uh, solid waste rules are always there. And then the operators of the facility. Operating plans are written for the operator, not for the inspector, not for your engineer, but for the operator. They need to be able to use them. So if you have questions, you can call me. Um, and then inf any information on your permit and operating plans, you can contact the permitting section. Any questions on operating plans? Yes, ma'am. So we have a um, composting that's being done off site, where you're only at the transfer station for food uh, scraps. You should have that included how you handle the food scraps. So the question is, if you are a public waste transfer station and you are just doing food waste collection and not the actual activity of composting on site, does that need to be spelled out in your operating plan? Yes. Yes. You need to have, what are you doing? What containers are you collecting on in? How many? How often does it leave the site? Um, you can have the vendor in the section where all of that is written, which I think is section five. Um, you can have it in there, but we often say it's best to have your vendor list as an addendum, because if you're going to make those changes and if you have a type of permit where you need to let us know, you're calling us to have approvals on vendor changes, and that's not helpful. Um, it's a paperwork exercise. But yes, you do need to have that spelled out in there. And if you're composting on site, you need to have that spelled out. How are you doing it? Who's doing it from soup to nuts? Any other questions? Okay, with that, I'm gonna ask Paige if you can pause the recording, and then I'm gonna ask our panelists to come up and have a seat in the panel table. Mm -hmm. Lower this. Nope, just these tables. As long as you're sitting at this table, you're good. I just need to lower this so it's not looking foot over your head. <laughs> you have one. Oh, and we'll add you need one more chair. Yeah. 